pomp, Cavalcade of America, starring Helen Hayes. Good evening, this is Helen Hayes. I'm sure you'll enjoy our cavalcade tonight, an original radio play by Frank Gabrielson called Good Morning, Miss Teichman. But first, here's Bill Hamilton for the DuPont Company. Thank you, Miss Hayes. Three million persons are injured in their homes each year, and falls in the home account for 17,000 fatal accidents. To help prevent small rugs from slipping, sliding, or creeping, use DuPont Rug Anchor. Rug Anchor is a non-skid sponge rubber underlay that is dustproof and waterproof. It won't harbor moths, and it can be trimmed to fit any size rug. You can help safeguard your family against costly, painful falls by putting DuPont Rug Anchor under floor coverings. Rug Anchor is one of the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry. An original radio play for the DuPont Cavalcade of America, starring Helen Hayes as Miss Tyke. Sail on, O union, strong and great. Louder, please, John. Humanity with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years. Don't be afraid of it, John. He's hanging breathless on thy face. Is that all you mean, Miss Tykeman? She is a teacher, this Miss Tykeman. A grammar school teacher, Joanna Tykeman, teaching 7B in a neighborhood school. She is, say, 60 and gray. But she stands straight as the shortest line between two points. And she knows, as we know our mothers and our bank accounts, subjects, predicates, objects, and the dangling participle. She knows when Vicksburg fell, how high the Andes are, and the names of all the capitals of the states. She knows Huck Finn and Hiawatha, and can begin when in the course of human events and say the entire declaration. Besides this, Miss Teichman knows each year the names, the faces, the abilities and worths of a brand new class of 40. Good morning, Miss Teichman. Good morning, class. But what do we know of Miss Teichman? We were all one of those classes of 40 once under Miss Teichman, or Miss Levy, or Mrs. Miller, or Mr. Jones. We spend as much time with them as with our parents, almost, and owe them as much, almost. But what do we know of Miss Teichman? Suppose we were ordered to write a composition called Miss Teichman, a teacher. Take pen and paper, please. Now write. Uh, Miss Teichman lives in a lower flat at 311 Cheney Street. She lives with her mother, an old lady. Every school day, Miss Teichman gets up early and marks papers. Uh, some teachers do this the night before, but Miss Teichman thinks it is healthy to get to bed early. Breakfast, Joanna. All right, Mother. I'll mark the rest of these before class. Oh, fail them all. And that's the way they'll all end up. <laughs> Not this class. They're the brightest I've ever had. Oh, you say that every year. Are you through with the newspaper, Mother? Yeah, I don't know why I ever read it. Between the Russians and the high prices, it certainly don't give me any pleasure. And there's four new cases of infantile paralysis. Where? There, on the front page. I meant where in the city? Well, three of them are in Southside High. Mm, I found it. The other's in Manlia Street. Right next to us. Uh, how many cases are there in your school now? Still three. Well... Here's something in the paper about Charles Oram. Uh -huh. He's getting an honorary degree at the university today. Isn't that splendid? Uh, uh, Joanna, uh, when is Mr. <laughs> Kraft leaving? Uh, soon as the Board of Education picks a new principal to take his place. Uh, think they'll pick you? For principal? Of uh, course not. Well, why shouldn't they? You passed the principal's examination years ago, and you've certainly had enough experience. That's one reason they'd never picked me. 
had too much experience. Anyway, if the Board of Education wants me, all they have to do is ask me. But I'm quite sure they never will. Did you ask Mr. Kraft to recommend you? No, I didn't. Huh. Too modest, I suppose. I've been at Robert's school 38 years, Mother. If the board wishes me to become principal, they have only to appoint me. They know that. I shall certainly not humiliate myself by begging for the job. Pride killed a cat, I always say. <laughs> Curiosity killed the cat, Mother. Mm -hmm. Pride goeth before a fall. Oh. Well, I must go or I'll be late. Do you mind if I cut this out, this clipping about Charles Orham? Oh, There's nothing on the back but the comics. Go ahead. I always read the comics first thing. <laughs> Come to attention, please. Class, stand. The Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. My country, tis only sweet land of on Monday morning, September 8th, 1910, when Joanna Teichman, fresh from normal school, stood face to face with her first class in this same sunny classroom, some few of all the facts she taught in 1910 were different than they are today. The ruler of the Russian people is called the Tsar. The population of Los Angeles is around 300,000. Its principal industry is found in the machine shop products. Marconi's experiments with the wireless may be a step towards the unification of all nations because its vast possibilities of communication will bring understanding to all people and hence put an end to war. Yet for the great part, what young Miss Teichman taught us then, old Miss Teichman teaches our children here today. How do you find the area of a circle, Johnny? Pi R squared. And what is pi, class? 3.1416. This is Pi. This is Archimedes, Euclid, Einstein. This is the straight line between two points of thinkers, from the first man thinking to the last man thinking. The straight line and the circle. This is teaching. Will the first two rows take positions at the blackboard, please? Edward, John, come to my desk, please. Have either of you any explanation to offer for fighting in class? Ed hit me first, Miss Teichman. Did you, Edward? Yes. Why? I, I wanted to, that's all. I'm sure you had a reason, Edward. Oh, he made fun of me. How? I won't tell. What did you say, John? Nothing. You did, too. You said my clothes didn't fit good. Well, what's that to get sore about? You can't help it if they don't fit. Everybody knows you get your clothes from the son of that man your father chauffeurs. You shut up or I'll bust you one in your mouth. Edward, John. Oh, I am deeply disappointed in both you boys. You're 12 now, Edward. You're in the seventh grade. You're old enough to know better than to start fighting in a classroom, regardless of what John says to you. You'll remain after school every day for the rest of this week. Yes, Miss Tyke. And about you, John, I'm even more disturbed. Oh, he hit me first. After you tried to make him feel inferior because his clothes aren't like yours. I don't like seeing any American, or anyone for that matter, making fun of another person because of his clothes or his family's position or his nationality. In addition to remaining after school every day for the rest of the week, as Edward will, I have a newspaper clipping here I wish you to read to the class. Out loud? If you will, please. Class, return to your seats, please. Now, this is an editorial I cut from the Morning Herald to read to you as part of our current events work. But I'd rather have John read it now. I think you'll all see why. You may begin, John. Deserving laurels. Today, our university is conferring an honorary degree upon a former resident of this city. As a delegate to the United Nations, Charles Francis Oram is now a world figure. But many of us can remember the days when he was a struggling young lawyer in our midst. Out on University Place, 
There are families who can still recall how he tended furnace for them when he worked his way through college. And one or two of us on this paper can even bring to mind that it was Charles Francis Oram, aged 11, who in 1913 won the Herald's News Boys Prize for selling the most papers. In honoring him, the university is honoring also what we like to think of as the American way. We are reminded anew that opportunity for all is more than just a phrase. What the paper doesn't say is that that man used to be one of my pupils. John, can you guess what desk he sat in? Edwards? No, John. Yours. And I hope in the future you'll try to make as good use of it as Charles Oram did. I will, Miss Teichman. Honest, I will. And I'm sorry I said what I did, Ted. His clothes really fit swell. I'm sorry I belted you. Shake hands now. Take your places at the blackboard. This, too, is teaching to teach Protestant, Catholic, Jew, the native-born, the immigrant, rich, poor, the Methodist and Seventh-day Adventist, the boys who wear buttons for the candidates their parents prefer, Republican and Democrat. All this human tangle needs to know the straight line between two points, between aspiration and result in this democracy. You are listening to an original radio play, Good Morning, Miss Teichman, starring Helen Hayes on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. is relating for us a few simple instances in the daily life of a very important member of the American scene. She is a teacher, Miss Teichman, a grammar school teacher. Joanna Teichman teaching 7B in a neighborhood school. Now there will be a test. Oh, no comments, please. Now we will have a test in geography. I have written the questions on the blackboard here beneath this map. You will have 30 minutes in which to answer them. Take pen and paper and begin. Now there will be a test in geography. Now there will be a test, 7B. You will have 30 minutes in which to answer. You will have a lifetime, too, for answering. This test goes on. Can you find Nagasaki on the map? Can you find Lake Success? You have 30 minutes, class, in which to answer. You have a lifetime and no more. Keep your eyes on your own paper, please. Now is the 40 pens of 7B put answers on an empty page. And the wall clock ticks. The door swings open and Miss Henry, who teaches 7A, appears and beckons to Miss Teichman. May I see you a minute, Miss Teichman? Well, I knew you were having a test. I thought you could step outside for a minute and keep an eye on your class through the glass. If I come out, I shall not spy on them through the window, Miss Henry. Class, I'm leaving the room for a few minutes. During that time, you're on your honor not to talk or look at one another's papers. Is that clear? Yes, Miss yes, You trust your class more than I do mine. What do you want, Miss Henry? I don't like to be out of class too long. Oh, don't worry. I can see every one of them from where I'm standing. Uh-oh. There's a boy in the back row who's... I prefer not to hear it, Miss Henry. The honor system binds me as much as it does them. Oh, it's all right anyway. He was only turning around to pick up an eraser he dropped. What was it you wanted? Well... While my group was taking art class, I stopped around at the principal's office. And I got talking with his secretary. And we decided something very interesting. Really? You'll say really when you hear. It's about you. Oh, is it? We think you're quite likely to be the new principal. What makes you say that? 
Well, you're eligible. You've got a fine record. And there just aren't many good people available. Most of us haven't got the educational requirements the way you have. Well, then this is just supposition on the part of you and Genevieve. No, it's not exactly supposition. I happen to know that Mr. Kraft is sending for you sometime this afternoon. Well, that could be about anything. <laughs> well, he's also been talking with the Board of Education. Genevieve didn't know exactly what went on, but it was something about a new principal. And she knows it's going to be decided today. And you're seeing him today, so... It doesn't prove anything. Oh, come now. Who deserves it if you don't? I like to think I do. But I know there are plenty of other teachers who deserve it. Miss Teichman. Have you finished already, Helen? No, my, my neck hurts. Where, Helen? Right back here. It, it hurts when I turn my head. Have you been in a draft? Uh, I don't think so. Has anyone been talking to you about why it's bad to have a stiff neck, Helen? You mean about the infantile paralysis? Yes, Helen. But I've got a stiff neck, Miss Teichman. I'm not making it up. Honest. Oh, it hurts. Helen, you go downstairs now and tell the nurse about this. I haven't got paralysis, Miss Teichman. No, dear. You've just got a stiff neck. Go on now. There's nothing to be afraid of. But, but what about my chest? You can make that up later. Yes, Miss Teichman. Do you think it's her neck that's bothering her, or her imagination, or the test? We'll just have to see what the nurse has to say. Well, don't worry. There's nothing you can do about it. I know. Well, I must get back. You should. That boy in the back is turning around again. And this time, I don't think he's dropped an eraser. <laughs> Miss Teichman, Joanna Teichman, teacher of 7B at Roberts School, at 3.44 this afternoon sits waiting outside the office of the principal. Beside her is a case of trophies, silver cups and statuettes of bronze. One marked 1921 reminds Miss Teichman of Fred Bettinger, who won the 50 and the 100-yard dashes both that year. As she sits waiting for the principal... Miss Teichman wonders what has become of Fred Bettinger. Uh, Mr. Kraft, we'll see you now, Miss Teichman. Thank you. Oh, there's a man in there from the Board of Education who seems very anxious to talk to you, Miss Teichman. Well, I'll go in now. I believe you wish to see me, Mr. Kraft? Oh, yes, yes. Come in, Miss Teichman. Uh, this is Mr. Grant. How do you do, Mr. Grant? Miss Teichman, hello. Uh, sit down, won't you, Miss Teichman? Thank you. The Board of Education has sent Mr. Grant here. Uh, he wanted to meet you. I understand that you're the senior teacher in the school. Next year will be my 39th year, if I'm here. Oh, oh you'll be here, Miss Teichman. Mm -hmm. Particularly these days, we need people with your experience. I'm probably going to be after you with questions all day long at first. I don't understand. Well, there's so much I'll need to know about the place. Uh, Mr. Grant is to be the new principal. I see. And since you are the senior teacher, I felt I ought to meet you before the others. I'm going to need a lot of help from you, Miss Teichman. I'll be glad to do whatever I can, Mr. Grant. With cooperation like yours, Miss Teichman, we can't fail to have a thriving school. I'm sure we will, Mr. Grant. <clears throat> uh, well, I, I don't think Mr. Grant wanted any detailed information today, Miss Teichman. It's really a matter of getting acquainted. Uh, isn't that so, Grant? That's right. Just so long as I can feel free to call on Miss Teichman for assistance from time to time. Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Grant. <clears throat> well... There isn't anything further you want. I should get back to my room. I have some tests to mark. Goodbye, Mr. Grant. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Kraft. Goodbye. On Monday morning, September 8th, back in 1910, young Miss Teichman faced the world in her first class with apprehension determination, an infinities of hope. On Monday afternoon, February 2nd, 1948, old Miss Teichman sits in the presence of a ticking clock and two recalcitrant boys. Under a column of 38 years, she draws a line and is, for once, uncertain of the sum. It's 4.30. Edward, you and John may go now. Thanks, Miss Teichman. Yeah, thanks. I do not like yeah. 
fed in my classroom, Joan. I'm sorry, Miss Teichman. See you tomorrow. Goodbye, boys. Goodbye, Miss Teichman. From 1910 to 1948, and underneath the straight line drawn, what is the sum? <sighs> what is the sum? Oh, dear. <laughs> Hello, Miss Teichman. Hello. Can I do something for you? I guess you don't remember me, do you, Miss Teichman? No, I'm afraid I don't. Well, this is a sort of a blow to my pride, Miss Teichman. I used to sit at this desk right here. <laughs> but I guess a lot of kids have sat here since. You can't be expected to remember us all. I used to think I could. I guess I'm getting old. Oh, not mm -hmm. you, Miss Teichman. Well, you couldn't possibly know me. After all, in 30-odd years, a man does change. If it was that long ago and you sat at that desk, you must be... <laughs> That's right. Charlie Orem. Charlie Orem. <laughs> I was taking a walk through the old neighborhood. I couldn't go by without coming in to say hello. How good of you to come, especially at this time. But how awful I didn't recognize you. It's inexcusable. Why, I, I, I've seen your picture in the paper at least once a week lately. Oh, you couldn't recognize anybody from those pictures, <laughs> Miss Tychman. <laughs> I don't think I ever really associated the pictures with you anyway. <laughs> Whenever I thought of you standing up in the United Nations and talking to all those great men, I... Somehow always saw you as a 12-year-old boy whose hair wouldn't stay combed. <laughs> <laughs> and now there's no hair to comb. <laughs> <laughs> Still making jokes all the time, I see, Charles. I need to these days. Oh, I wish the class were here to see you. You know, we read about you this very morning in the paper. If, if you only knew what an inspiration a success like yours is to the girls and boys. Mm, I hope it is a success. Why, Charles, you're a great man now. I don't feel that way when I think about the United Nations. You have great responsibilities, I know, Charles, but I don't worry about you not being able to handle them. <laughs> <laughs> you told me that once before I pitched a ball game. And you won, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and you'll win in whatever you're doing now. I know you will, Charles. You're that type of boy. I, I don't suppose you'd want to come in and talk to the class for a few minutes tomorrow, would you? Oh, I'd like to very much, Miss Teichman, but I'm taking the plane out tonight. Yes. You, you don't mind if I tell them about your coming to see me. It makes me very proud. Mm. Tell them about the time you caught me smoking in the cloakroom. So you remember that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how much I remember of what went on. And the older I get, the more complicated my life becomes, the more sense the simple, fundamental things you taught us seem to make. I don't mean just the history and the arithmetic and the grammar. I mean the way you made us feel about life, Miss Teichman. The truth was the most important thing in the world. And there, if we were right, we didn't need to be afraid of anything. We don't, Charles. I remember there was a poem you had us learn. Something about somebody building a ship. The building of the ship. Ah, that's it, that's it. I always liked it. Not that it's exactly Shakespeare, I suppose. Naturally not. It's Longfellow. <laughs> anyway, it has a, has a feeling of courage in it that always excited me. Uh, how'd it go? Uh, thou too, sail on, O ship of state, sail on, O union, strong and great. Uh, humanity with... The... Don't be afraid of it, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years, is... It's... Hanging? Hanging? Hanging breathless on thy fate. Sail on, nor uh, fear to breast the sea. Uh, our uh, hearts, uh, our hopes are all uh, with thee. Our, our hearts, our, our hopes, our, our prayers, prayers, our tears, our, our faith triumphant, triumphant or our, our fears, fears are, are all with thee. thee. Are, are all, all with thee. thee. Thank you, Helen Hayes. Now, here's Bill Hamilton of the DuPont Company. It happened in Ohio, 
Logan County, in fact, near Belfountain. One hot sunny day, I was helping my grandfather pack bales of wool, wrapping the wool in burlap. I was humming something about toting that bale and working hard. And all of a sudden, I felt sharp claws on my leg. I brought my hand down, but not before the animal, whatever it was, slashed into my knee with its teeth. It ran scurrying away, and then I saw what it was. It was a rat, a big brown one. Rats do sometimes attack human beings, and they attack us in other ways beside the one I have described. They attack our property, food, and health. They are a sly, filthy, vicious enemy. When they make their way into your home, they can damage plumbing, gnaw through interior walls and insulation, undermine foundations, destroy electric wiring, sometimes even causing fires. They also spread disease. On the farm, rats can spread disease not only to people, but to poultry and livestock. They often kill chicks and even full-grown hens. Some farms have so many rats that farmers expect as a matter of course to have a certain number of their baby chicks mangled or carried off by rats. As for food, it has been estimated that every year rats eat or spoil nearly 200 million bushels of grain in this country. Just imagine what this extra amount of food would mean to us and to the really hungry in other countries. This year, American farmers are asked to make an all-out drive against rats to save this tremendous loss. A recent development of chemical science, ANTU, will help put the campaign over, but the farmers can't do it alone. You owe it to yourself and your family to make an effort to kill any rats you may have in your home or neighborhood. Rat poisons containing DuPont ANTU are effective against the common brown rat, and any rat poison with ANTU is easy to use. Bear in mind that it is a poison to humans and pets as well as rats. And follow the directions carefully. And two, a superior ingredient for rat poisons is a product of chemical science from the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Next week... Lincoln's Birthday Week, Cavalcade presents the distinguished Hollywood star Robert Young in Mr. Lincoln Goes to the Play, an absorbing story of the last day in the life of the great emancipator. We hope you'll be with us. We've invited many teachers to listen to tonight's broadcast, and we welcome their comments concerning our play, Good Morning, Miss Teichman. And, of course, as every week, we welcome and appreciate the letters from all Cavalcade listeners. Just address your letters to the DuPont Company, Radio Section, Wilmington, Delaware. I'll repeat that. The DuPont Company, Radio Section, Wilmington, Delaware. Now, featured in tonight's play with Helen Hayes was House Jameson as the narrator. Music for the DuPont Cavalcade is composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Bryan. And this is Ted Pearson inviting you to listen next Monday to Mr. Lincoln Goes to the Play, starring Robert Young. Cavalcade of America is presented from the stage of the Longacre Theater on Broadway in New York and is brought to you each week by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. To the school children listening tonight, you have an opportunity to nominate your favorite teacher in a nationwide contest. For full details of this contest, listen to the Quiz Kids program next Sunday afternoon on NBC. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.